Hey everybody, welcome to this week's video. Coach here. Hey, this week we're talking about and asking some questions of about the topic of concrete or paver block. Which do you have? Some pros and cons of each so that maybe you can make a little more informed decision if you move forward with a landscape project yourself. Hey, I'm glad you're here. Let's get rolling, shall we? So, concrete or paver blocks? Uh, for me, it was a little bit of both, but in a little different fashion. For me, the paver stones and paver blocks always were related to vertical elements of the landscapes that I created. They were either small retaining walls up to about four feet, or they were patio wall enclosures with little pillars and stuff. And that was about it. When it came to flat surface, flat surface stuff, I was 100% a concrete guy. I never got into paver stones, and here's why. In the contracting world, everything surrounds time. It really does. And when you are a one-man show, a chief cook and bottle washer, doing paver flat surfaces was a very time-consuming element for me and my customers generally wanted a combination of concrete or pavers. And because of the cost difference and the laborious efforts that you're gonna learn about here today, they always sided with concrete. In addition, I really fell into a pattern of either delegation or relegation. I did not wanna relegate myself to the, the long-term process of paver stone laying when it was just me. And I had an excellent, excellent uh, concrete guy as a subcontractor that I used all the time. Wonderful man by the name of Antonio. We did many, many projects over the years, including Weed Patch Ranch where Meister and I used to live. And it was easy. And I don't mean easy in the way of easy work. You know, the forming, the pouring, the grading, and all that other stuff. But the finishing, the finishing, which you're going to learn here in a few minutes, is everything when it comes to concrete work. I was very good at forming stuff up, of sloping and grading, backfilling, doing all the things that you needed to do, even putting in the metal. Uh, I had no problems with that. I had no problems with pouring and screeding, but it was Antonio that had the finishing art. Him and a few of his crew that would come in and do just a, an outstanding job that reflected very well on me. And for me, being the professional was not the time to start learning a whole nother sector of paver stone. Do I know how to do it? Yes. Do I like to do it? Eh, not when you got Antonio over here and that's what the customer wants. So I never really got into it full tilt. Just the vertical elements, just the walls and the, the patio enclosures. So let's talk about concrete first, some of the pros and cons. I think uh, the biggest pro about it is there's versatility in colors. There is much more instantaneous results. And I don't mean like snap your fingers. I mean like uh, you could form one day and pour the next. And the third day you got a patio. And oftentimes that patio can be super small or it can be, you know, 400, 600 square feet worth of patio, but it's done in the day as long as you have the right people there. And that's the whole thing about concrete is you need people. You may be able to form it yourself. You may be able to bring in some backfill and, and after you've set your forms, you backfill to the forms and you give yourself that four inch depth or whatever you decide to do and you put in the metal and you tie it off you know and you make your basket in there and then you order up your concrete but if you have a 18 yard pour not very smart to try to do it with just you and the missus okay you need some guys the other thing is is something that i learned very early on in concrete career and that is 
work smarter, not harder. And I always used a pumper for anything over five yards. I just spent the money and the pumper would be there a half hour before the truck. Antonio and I would, and his crew would be there just before the truck because we had everything finished up the day before. We'd wet things down and we'd be off, to, off and running. And five yards, 10 yards, 18, 25 yards, it didn't matter. The pumper would put it in as fast as we could possibly screed it off and keep on going. So you have that uh, ability to work fast, provided the manpower is there. Now, when it comes to colors, you also have colors and you have finishes. Uh, colors can range from charcoal to fire engine red, depending on how much color is added to it at the plant, whatever color you want. Here's the thing about color. If you do not seal it afterwards, after it's done its efflorescence over a 30 day period, you wash it off, dry it and seal it, that color will fade over time, no matter what happens. You have to, on a colored concrete surface, you have to put a sealer on it about every two years, depending on where you're located. If you were in the, the desert Southwest, it's almost every year because it's just a harsh, harsh, dry environment there. Here's another thing about concrete. It's the style of finishes. Now for me, in order to keep a price point where I wanted it to be, I didn't get into a lot. I never had Antonio doing a lot of stamped work, uh, stamped and colored work, because in Northern California back in the day, that was already up into the teens per square foot of cost. That gets pretty expensive. You have a 400 square foot patio or more, you know, you're talking thousands and thousands of dollars. So I did it where I used a, uh, I believe it was called Omaha Tan color. And then I, he had a uh, finishing technique that was called a banded broom finish. And he would broom finish it with a horsehair brush. And then he would finally do a band around the outside of a smooth trowel. And that was it. We did troweled cold joints in between. So when it did crack and concrete will crack, you cannot stop it for doing what it wants to do. You can only try to direct the cracks and be able to mitigate them to a minimum as possible. And he had it down to a science. So in the concrete preparation world, preparation is everything. The leveling of your forms with a slight slope. How much do I always say? An eighth of an inch per foot. So on four foot walkways, you're gonna have about a half inch that's going to taper off from one side to another, perfect for drainage. If you have big patios, you're going from your house, maybe your slider out of your family room, out an eighth of an inch per foot. So if you had, you know, 10 feet, how much is that gonna be? I'll let you figure that out, okay? So make sure your slope is there. And this also applies to the paver stone patios, which I'll talk about here in just a second. So think about your skill set. I've already been really transparent about my skill set. Concrete and I were acquaintances. We were not BFFs in any way, shape, or form. And the only reason was, is I never, I never really mastered the finishing skill that Antonio and his guys did. They're just masters at it. And if you know your strengths and weaknesses, you can focus on that and mitigate the weaknesses and tackle the strengths head on and do a good job. That's what I did. So let's talk about some cons. Cons of cement work. It's right here. Time. Time of the day of the poor is against you from the time, the first, the first thing that comes down the chute of that concrete truck, time is against you. How do you stay ahead of that time frame? That is people. People that can work together, work as a team, know what they're doing. So I ask you, where's your skill set in that? Do you have somebody in your circle of influence that you can tap into? I'm sure you're a hard worker and put to task, you'll keep up with anybody. But if you have somebody that's within your family or friendship or workplace structure that you could feed them one day 
and you get all your forming and pouring and maybe invite them over for a beer or something and say, hey, what do you think? Do I need to make any adjustments? And then would you and Joe and Bob and you know Sam be available next Saturday if I ordered up you know 10 yards, could we pour it? That's where you really end up staying ahead of that timeline because you have a finite amount of time. Depending on where you're at, depending on the weather conditions, the humidity level, what type of cement you're ordering, what amount of sack mix, which I'll cover here in just a second, and what amount of slump, which I'll cover also in just a second, you have that finite, finite amount of time where you have to get that cement in the forms, screed it off, get an initial bull float finish to it, and then let it set a bit. And that sounds easy as I stand here in front of you, but it is not because there's all kinds of things. If you have a 20 by 20 patio and you don't have a 20 foot screed board and you're having to do half one side, half the other, and then string line things and make sure that you don't have any waves or anything else in there, that time starts to intensify every about 15 minutes, about 15 to 20 minutes, it intensifies. And after about an hour, you better have your stuff down. It better be bull floated off and you better have some moisture sheen at the top of that pour. Otherwise, you're gonna have a hard time putting in cold joints unless you cut them. Um, and you're gonna have a hard time putting a good finish to it. So how do you stay ahead of it? You know your weather that's coming up. If you know you're going to have a warm day, say a 90 degree day, and you're, you're on the schedule for 10 o'clock pour that day, you didn't get the first truck or the second truck, you got the third truck, and you're 10 o'clock, you can order up the cement, and I suggest there's three different sack mixes, four sack, five sack, and six sack mixes. Make sure if you want to have a really nice finish, go six sack, don't go cheap. Don't go four because four is really prone to cracking. Five sack is kind of an industry standard and six sack is the gold standard. So if you go six sack, ask the driver when he gets there to put a little extra water in it. Make it a, make it a slump of say 5.5 uh, instead of three or four, which is gonna come out like a, almost a pile, okay? Ask for a 5.5 slump, maybe a six if you're really, 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 really hot. And you can put in a retardant at the plant. You can ask for a, a half percent retardant if it's really hot out. If it's really cold, you may want to ask for an accelerant that'll help uh, set it up that much faster. We'll end up put, we're putting it right there, the accelerant. It's a calcium chloride, I think. So we have sack mix, the so three different kinds. We have the slump mix, generally about three to four different choices, depending on the driver. The driver's, driver is everything when it comes to these pours. You can have good drivers that'll really help you out, and then you'll have drivers that, nah, they're, they should be doing something else, but they won't help you out. Then there is time again time of how are you going to put this pour into where it's supposed to go? Are you going to wheelbarrow it or are you going to pump it? Now when I got out of the business, pumping was about $350. $350 for up to about 20 yards. And that was over and done with in an hour as long as the trucks were coming in. 20 yards of concrete put in place inside an hour. You wheelbarrow 20 yards of concrete by hand, you're probably talking three to four hours. Unless you have 30 people to help you and 30 wheelbarrows, you're going to take a very long time, which leads me to standby time. Some cement companies will charge standby time beyond a half hour, 45 minutes, maybe an hour, and then they start charging you by the minute that truck is sitting there. And if you, uh, you got a 10 yard pour and you only have two wheelbarrows going, you're gonna have some standby time from some companies. So be aware of that. 
Now, what about some of the cement companies that have a, a U-Haul type of trailers, which I used quite a bit when I did small pours myself? You had one yard, one yard mixers that they would mix for you at the plant and then a motorized drum that would keep it turning while you hauled it to your project and then it would tilt and pour, wheelbarrow it in place or if you could, if you're real lucky, you could back that thing right next to the pour and then offload it, go back and get another yard. Maestro and I almost got caught with our pants down one time we had about a yard and a half pour. But the problem was, is we had to take the cart back for that extra half yard, about 20, 22 miles from weed patch to the supplier. And I had them mix it rather wet, the first load, so it would be okay, but it was warm. It was a 90 degree day. By the time I got that half yard back, that other stuff was starting to set. And I still had a half yard we had to get in the forms. And it was a, chase your tail hour, it really was. And by the time I was done, I was pounding, literally pounding the edging to get enough moisture up to the top to put a good finish on it. And it was a, quite a struggle. So be aware of that. Even, even the pros doing small tasks, can, it can get away from you. So we talked, about, we talked about sack mix, we talked about slump, the amount of water that is, it's delivered into, and then we talked about time. Time is your, Time is your enemy and you really have to manage it in order to stay ahead of that curing process. Okay, so let's turn to another option. Let's turn to paver stones. And honestly, uh, where we're at right now, we have a project coming up in the future. I don't know if it's gonna be this fall or if it's gonna be next spring. I'm not sure yet but we are 95% assured we're probably going to go with paver stones and a small paver patio enclosure block wall. And why do I say that? Well, number one, we're in a new part of the country where we don't know a lot of contractors and that kind of stuff. And the project that we're wanting to take on, we want to have time on our side. And when you're dealing with patio paver stones, you can do your excavation, you can do your uh, grading and sloping, you can do your screed pipes, you can do your bedding layer, and you can have your materials on site and start your installation. But say if the weather goes crappy, you could cover the whole project up and come back to it. There isn't that curing thing that uh, haunts you when you're dealing with concrete. Paver stones, do a little bit at a time. That's why I think it's really good for the DIYer, provided the preparation or the prep is done properly. That is everything in vertical walls, and I've talked about that. It is everything about paver stone flat surfaces. It's everything. You're excavating down, you're putting in aggregates, you're compressing them and compacting them mechanically usually, and we do them in what we call lifts. So about two to three inches at the most, put down two to three inches, you compact it or you, you bring in a mechanical compactor, put two more inches, you compact it, put two more inches, you compact it, and depending on what application you're using, walkways, patios, driveways with vehicular traffic, uh, walls that are gonna be over four feet, will depend on how deep your base is gonna be. Then once you have that base in, and you've put your screed pipes on there, generally one inch pipes, we do what we call our bedding layer, where you bring in some fine stuff. It can be sand, it can be plaster sands, it can be a small chip rock, uh, something that is very malleable that you can screed off and level to the tops of those pipes you pull the pipes out, trowel in that little trench that the pipes left, and you're ready to go. You're ready to start putting your pavers down. And you start at one end or one corner, and you work into the field of the project, walking on the pavers themselves, never on the bedding layer. And you're putting them down in a careful, flat, vertical method, so you're not digging in. And then you have a little rubber mallet, maybe, 
maybe just a tap perfectly level if you want to. But if you've done a good bedding layer, you're not going to have to do it. You, you, will, you will be fine. And then you get uh, all the field filled in. Then it's time to cut perimeter block and finish off the, the edges. And then it's time to band it. And you can band it with either a metal edging, which I'll show you right here, or you can do what they call a concrete shoulder, where you mix up some uh, quickcrete and you just very carefully hand pour a shoulder right at the very edge of your project and hand trowel it in place about that far below where your, your top of your patio is or your walkway and then just let it cure and that becomes the shoulder that holds everything in. Then you can grade stuff out. Now once it's in place you're going to want to infill all those joints and cracks with a plaster sand but don't go cheap on me, go get what they call some polymeric sand. And what it is, is it has a binding agent in it. It's very fine sand and it'll sift itself down in between those cracks. You broom it off really good so there's no residues on top. Then I used to, you know, what if I had a small project, I would just take the blower and just lightly blow the, the binding agent dust off and then come back and mist the whole project probably two or three times to let it soak into those cracks and it becomes like concrete, uh, close to concrete anyway. And then there you go. Now you've solidified the whole patio and you've been able to do it over the course of maybe several weekends if you want to and DIY friendly. Now choices. You have all kinds of choices. Now we're up in the Northeast right now. So we're, we've become very familiar with a company called, and I hope I don't butcher the name, I believe it's French and it's called Gane, G-A-G-N-E, Gane and Sons uh, Masonry Products. It's probably what we're going to be using. So look for that. But across the country, I know there are several different suppliers. One on the West Coast, Paverstone, uh, Old Castle, or, or Castle Stone, I believe. Uh, so there's many different products out there and they come in a variety of colors and textures and you just have to find your own personal preference. You can peruse some of this stuff at the box stores. You will find those paver blocks there. So look at that. So let me ask you this. Where do you stand on this? Are you a concrete person? Do you have nothing but concrete patios? Or do you have the paver stones and paver blocks? And if you are going to be a DIYer, which one do you think you would take on? I'd really like to know the pros and cons from your perspective. In the future, you're going to be a part of this project. I will guarantee you that. So look forward to that and a step-by-step -step process. Am I a expert in it? I'm just above an amateur and you're going to see that. And we're going to, we're going to play around with it when we get to that point. I sure do appreciate you guys hanging around. I'd love a like and a subscribe if you felt it was worth it. And don't forget the website, youryardcoach.com, if you'd like to take a look and learn just a little bit more about a whole lot of landscaping education. I'll see you guys next Friday. As always, to your landscape success, bye for now.